What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcoming Noah back to the channel. It's been uh, it's been a minute. Uh, we're breaking down the wide receivers that came out of the NFL draft today. So earlier this week on Tuesday, we looked at the top rookie running backs for 2019 fantasy football. We're going to switch gears, head over to the pass catchers and the wide receivers. Now, there are uh, a lot of guys to talk about within the top three or so rounds, and that's kind of the draft capital that we like to focus on because anything past that, the, the bus rates and the hit rates are getting uh, pretty wide and varied, and you pretty much need to be drafted within the top three rounds in order to you know, give yourself an opportunity to get on the field and really produce as uh, an NFL receiver, a fantasy wide receiver. So today we're jumping into the 2019 fantasy football top wide receiver rookies. Noah, what's cracking? How's your, uh, your finals week going? What's going on? It's all right so far. Got one down. Got a few left. Uh, might do well on one of them for unforeseen circumstance, uh, circumstances that the professor can't know about. You but, may or may not have the answers. <laughs> uh, it depends when this video goes public. I'll release that information. <laughs> when do you need me to, when do you need me to, uh, to it's hold tomorrow. it up? <laughs> Wednesday. Okay, good. Yeah, this is going to go live on Friday, so you should be yeah. good. She's about 75 years old, but I know she's a big fan of the channel, so. <laughs> <laughs> does, does any of your professors know about the channel? <laughs> no. I don't even <laughs> think she knows what the internet is. <laughs> what class is that for? Management. She writes everything on a chalkboard. So Management? It's, like just business management? Yeah. It's ridiculous. It's oh, you have a 75 year old. Has she ever managed a business? No. She... <sighs> We could get into a lot of things about her, but I don't think she's managed much in her <laughs> life at all. <laughs> Let's hold it for the wide receiver talk. So um, one of the, you know, I, I think the skill players overall in this draft happen to be very uh, down, I guess, if you want to say, in terms of like past years. And we, we usually have some top wide receivers or at least the top running back or something kind of go off the board. It took till pick 24 for the first running back to go off the board to the Oakland Raiders. That was Josh Jacobs, of course. And then, Marquise Brown, Hollywood Brown was the first wide receiver. It was, it was somewhat of a surprise. DK Metcalf was the uh, pretty heavy favorite per Vegas prior to the draft leading up. Hollywood Brown uh, goes to the Ravens after they trade back from the 22 pick with the Eagles to move back to 25. They take Hollywood Brown here, and uh, it's, you know, there's a lot of different factors in play when you're looking at Hollywood Brown from a redraft, a dynasty, a rookie draft, whatever it is. He's an explosive playmaker, ridiculous talent. I'm not surprised he went in the first round, but he is coming off a very recent Liz Frank foot injury, which is obviously a very serious injury. I actually taped with uh, Dr. Jesse Morse earlier this week, and we're going to go over um, some of the you know top wide receiver injuries from last year or whatever. And uh, he, he's very nervous about the Liz Frank when it comes to Hollywood Brown. The more concerning thing I think here is the fact that he lands in Baltimore with Lamar Jackson, who can't really throw the ball. So, like, what what are your takeaways from – Hollywood Brown being the first wide receiver off the board and like the fit in Oakland. That definitely, mean, Baltimore. Uh, yeah, Baltimore. It definitely shows like a confidence that they have in him, but the guy's coming off an injury and I know he's like an awesome talent, but you kind of have to look at the fact that he's played with back-to-back -back Heisman winners with Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray. Mm -hmm. and I'm not taking that away from him at all. He actually gets to play with another one in Lamar Jackson, but True. he also came from an offense that loves to throw the ball in Oklahoma to a team that I think threw about 38% uh, of the time after Jackson took over. They're a run heavy team. They even invested in a guy like justice Hill. I think that's his name, right? Yeah, and I love me some justice. Yeah. They invested. They already got Mark Ingram there. They have Kenneth Dixon, uh, Gus Edwards. They have such a run heavy team already. Um, the fact that they invested in Hollywood and uh, Boykin shows that they might want to throw the ball a little bit more. And I'm not saying that Jackson's never going to be able to throw the ball because obviously everybody progresses uh, on most cases. And he was kind of thrown into the fire halfway through the year. But for redraft leagues, I think I'm just going to stay away because I don't know what to expect out of this offense at all, especially, as you said, coming off this injury. You'll get into more like in another video. But I'm not sure. He'll, he'll be like a boom or bust guy. You can probably pick him up in best ball leagues. But other than that, I'm not really touching him. Yeah, I mean, you look at – Hollywood Brown and it's like they had John Brown last year who was mm -hmm. really good over the first half of the year with Joe Flacco Lamar Jackson takes over at quarterback and then his stats completely like plummet. Never top two catches after that yeah exactly so it's like well they, they clearly went into this draft with a plan right it was to add speed to this offense I, I'm not really sure how that fits with Lamar Jackson as a as a thrower um, because they you like you said like Hollywood super fast I think he ran what like a four three one maybe 
I don't, no, he didn't run because of his foot, but he, oh, he'll oh, probably right, right, test right. that. I mean, like reporting speeds first. are like in that area. And, uh, you know, a lot, some people liken him to Tyreek Hill. I don't think he's that versatile. I think he's more of like a Deshaun Jackson, I think, is a better comp. But they also bring in Miles Boykin, who, you know, weight adjusted speed score wise, he's a big receiver, but flies down the field. So it's like they're adding all the speed. Justice Hill's a 4 4 guy as well. Um, it, it's hard to see where they mesh in. I wouldn't be surprised if, if Hollywood Brown, this is more of a pick for the future. Um, and, and not so much 2019 because he might open the year on the pup list. He might not even play for the first 10 weeks or something like that. So, uh, yeah, redraft, I'm, I'm completely staying away from. I think just given the fact that he was the first wide receiver off the board in the NFL draft, like you really have to take some heavy consideration into that when it comes to like rookie and, and dynasty drafts. So like rookie drafts, he, he's probably going to border on the late first round, maybe early second round. I, I think like, at that point, if you are in the late first round, that means you have a good team and you probably are competing for a championship. So maybe you don't need immediate players at that point. So Marquise Brown could be a good pick for you. I think like missing on a first round pick is uh, is really important to like building your team or, or the lack of building your team. So I think like he presents a risk if you start looking at Hollywood anywhere within like the top eight or six, um, eight or six picks. But yeah. But I was just I was just gonna say he's too much of a boomer bust guy to put him in like a top five receiver chair, especially like you said, if you're picking in that area, your team wasn't doing well last year. And if yeah, you're gonna exactly. invest in him as being your next like big young receiver, I I don't have like much faith in it, especially early on in his career. Mm -hmm. So swinging from a late first round pick to arguably or probably the one on one in many drafts this year, we have Nikhil Harry. He was our pretty much consensus one-on-one prior to the draft. He goes off the board, last pick of the first round to, of course, the New England Patriots. Who else? Because they do their due diligence. They know who the best receivers are, who the best players are, and they pick them. They did so with Nikhil Harry. Now, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't really like Nikhil Harry because he doesn't separate, blah, 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 blah. But, like, I'm looking at Nikhil Harry, and even if you are concerned about those things, which you shouldn't be because he proved it on the field that he could be a legitimate you know, threat at any part of the field, deep contested catches, screens or whatever. There's not a better landing spot than the Patriots who are lacking weapons without Gronk, without Chris Hogan. They just have nothing going on there in the passing game realistically. And if there's any team that, you know, appreciates versatility and understands how to use, utilize their players, it's the Patriots. Nikhil Harry can be a big slot guy, but he could also play the outside. They'll use him in the screen game, which they do with like Julian Edelman all the time. So like, I don't, I don't know if you can necessarily have found a, a better landing spot for Nikhil Harry. So I'm assuming nothing has changed um, in, in terms of your outlook for Nikhil Harry now that he landed with the Patriots. No, I love him. And the thing about the like no separation argument, if you can't separate, but you're still putting up a thousand yards each year, you got to be pretty damn good. And exactly. now he's playing with a quarterback who's going to be more accurate than whatever the hell he had in college. And a quarterback that likes to throw sh like short intermediate routes where Harry eats on yards after the catch. He's going to be like every week he has like a hundred yard upside just because he could break one in that offense. They spread everything out there. Even if Josh Gordon comes back, him and Harry aren't going to play the same role. Josh Gordon's more of a field stretcher while Harry can work in the short and intermediate. And if he needs to, they can throw it deep. And as you said, with Gronk and Hogan out, that opens up like 120 targets. I think upwards of 15 red zone looks. So that's huge for him with the opportunities uh, side of things. Yeah, to be honest with you, I'm not even factoring Josh Gordon into his outlook. I was barely thinking about it last year, and then we go through all of 2018, and this shit happens again. Like, I, I think Josh Gordon getting on the field for the Patriots in 2019 is possibly like a 2% chance. I doubt we see that. So I, I feel like Gil Harry, while it's, it's tough to produce as a rookie wide receiver, you know, and put up like usable numbers. I think he has a legitimate chance to throw up, you know, 65, 70 catches, 900 yards and six to eight touchdowns. If things break right, he could absolutely fall into that back end wide receiver two uh, range with wide receiver one upside, like long term. So he's my one on one for sure. Um, moving over the third wide receiver off the board. This is kind of a surprise. Debo Samuel out of uh, South Carolina to the 49ers. I mean, there's a lot of good. I, I was really hoping they went with AJ Brown here because if AJ Brown went to the Niners, I, I, it would have been hard for me to fade him at the 101 spot, to be honest with you. So, like, what do you see out of, out of Debo Samuel here? In the write-ups I did, I actually kind of compared him to Pierre Garçon, like how he plays, how he played in his latter half of his career, not like the burner he was with the Colts. He's like a – he's small, but he's, like, built. He's, like, six foot and, like, 200, probably 15 pounds. Yeah, you he's don't see a lot of receivers built like that. It's kind of weird. He's like a running back. Yeah, he's huge. It's – I think he's going to be used both in the slot and on the outside – which is kind of 
like weird that they invested in him when they already have Pettis who kind of does that already. Yep. But I feel like their versatility will just allow both of them to be on the field at the same time because if one's in the slot, the other will be on the outside and vice versa. But he, I don't know. He's just a tough player. He makes uh, things happen after the catch. I kind I really like this landing spot, especially because the 49ers don't really have too many pass catchers outside of like Pettis and George Kittle. And I guess McKinnon's coming back. And especially because they invested this high of a pick in the second round on him, they're going to funnel him the ball. Yeah, that's that's the other thing that's like – he is like Pierre Garçon. He's also like Dante Pettis in the sense that they play not the same position. They're not the same type of receiver, receiver exactly. But it's like they're not – I'm having a hard time like defining what their offense is, like what their, the identity of their offense is with all these like random weapons and pieces just kind of thrown into the mix. Like, for Debo Samuel, where are, you, where are you looking at him in in rookie drafts? I mean, it's a good landing spot, and it's very early draft capital. But, like, I'm not sure that we're going to see a tons of production this year. I'm looking at where I have, like, my tentative ranks for the receiver position. And I have him seventh right now. So Wide receiver seven? Yeah, wide receiver seven. So probably somewhere, like, early second round. Yeah, because if you think about the running backs, it would be Jacobs, Montgomery, Sanders – depending on how much you like Henderson, Hawkinson will probably go before him. So yeah, back half first round, early second round. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'd agree with that in Debo. Um, next up we have AJ Brown who went at the 19th pick in the second round. This was, this was so fucking frustrating, bro. I was so I, mad. <laughs> because AJ Brown was someone I, I like, I just felt like he was a can't miss prospect. There's no part of his game that kind of stood out or, you know, it was an objective weakness between production metrics athleticism just getting it all done then he goes to the titans where one Corey davis is, is there already as like the alpha and aj brown could certainly take over that role but it's it's the fact that do we have a quarterback that can even create an alpha in this situation so you know marcus Mariota is my biggest concern this overall offense right they're going to be very run heavy in 2019 you well, have they got Tannehill. <laughs> don't forget about him i was going around in nashville and we were interviewing people I was like, what do you think about uh, – because everyone's like a Tennessee fan. I was like, what do you think about Tannehill coming over and uh, Marcus Mariota telling the press that it's, it's going to be really nice to sit behind a, a veteran and, and learn from him with Tannehill there. And, you know, it's, it's – like between the two of them, whoever fucking gets the starting job, it, it doesn't matter. Like neither of them Stink. are accurate. Neither of them can throw the ball. Like it, this is just a frustrating landing spot. So, like, what do you make of A.J. Brown? Is, it, does the talent outweigh the landing spot? It's tough to say. Their defense is so good. I think they allowed 18 points a game last year. And when they started feeding Derrick Henry the ball towards the end of the season and they were just pounding the rock, they were like better on offense than they were when they were actually throwing it. And the fact that Delaney Walker's coming back, I know he's old and he's coming off of a foot injury. So let's just say we count him out as like a non-factor. Okay. Between Corey Davis and him, the only time we've ever seen like two pass catchers be productive on this offense were Rashard Matthews and Delaney Walker. So – I guess you could say that there's a possibility that they both of them produce. That was also in like Marcus Mariota's best year ever. And they also didn't have a guy like Derrick Henry pounding the rock back there. So it's, there's not enough opportunity. And I do think he's better than Corey Davis, but I'm just not sure he's, he's the locked in like one Oh two receiver that he was before the draft. Yeah. Um, he's going to be in a very tight race. I think for that second wide receiver spot for me, I do think that over the long run, the talent will play itself out. I, I feel like he is sort of a can't miss prospect. So even if, you know, his 2019 production isn't necessarily there within the next couple of years, you're going to be able to get some heavy return on that investment. If you use the top, you know, five, seven pick on him in, in, uh, in rookie drafts, we don't know, like, you know, Mariota could be out of Tennessee by next year. Um, I highly doubt they think Tannehill is the quarterback of the future, but I would assume that Mariotti there has a very good year and, you know, he's their guy going forward or they figure out another quarterback for the year after that. So I think we'll have the situation kind of figured out within, you know, the next year or two years, which will be quick enough for AJ Brown. He is, he's not like he's a, an old receiver or anything like that. So um, I, I'm still looking at him in, you know, the early ish, but probably more like mid range as opposed to where we were looking at him prior to that. Now, yep. One last, one last thing about him. They just paid Adam Humphreys, too. And I think the best position for A.J. Brown to play is the slot. And the fact that they just paid, like, a 5'10 white guy to be a receiver on that team, I think he's going to have to man the slot or else he's just not going to be on the field. And I'm not sure that they pay guys just to not play at all. Yeah, so that's been- a really good point. So they'll probably use A.J. Brown on the outside with Corey Davis. Or, you know, 
I don't know if if they start using more of a, like a, a diverse offense and kind of like San Fran, where you have guys running around playing flanker and running around playing in the slot, or you know four wide, two guys in the slot. Maybe that maybe this isn't more of an indictment on the fact that they don't have a, a receiving tight end, right? Like Delaney Walker doesn't have a timetable to return, so it's like okay, we're gonna have to use maybe a lot more three wide receiver sets instead of you know two tight end or something like that. So it'll be interesting, but I'm definitely not excited about what's gonna happen in Tennessee this year. Yeah. Now, probably the biggest surprise of the draft, um, at least from an offensive standpoint, in the first two rounds was Kansas City. Kansas City traded up in the second round, the 24th pick of the second round. And you're thinking, okay, we need a Tyreek Hill replacement because he's going to be gone very soon, um, if not within the next week or two weeks. Are they going to go with Paris Campbell? Are they going to go with Andy Isabella? Are they going to go with D- uh, DK Metcalf, Akeem Butler, right? All these like polarizing names. And then you see McC- Nicole, am I saying this right? Nicole, like Nicole? Probably. Okay, I have probably. no clue. Then you see Nicole Hardman pop up on the board. And I'm like, you know, like you did the, the wide receiver write-ups in our draft guide. Um, so at I this point, I know maybe like the top 12, top 10, top 12 prospects and not even all like that, like in depth. So Nicole Hardman, Nicole Hardman, how the fuck you say it, pops up on the board <laughs> and I'm like, who the fuck is this guy? What did the Chiefs just do, and what does everyone else not know about this guy? So I watched a little film, and I, uh, you know, I, I did a little bit of research, and he's a small guy, and immediately you assume, like, okay, he is, like, the one-for-one replacement for Tyree Kill. And people assume that given, you know, given his small frame, he's 5'10", 187 pounds, ran a 4'3", so he has a long speed just like Tyree Kill does. Um, he's a very good contributor on special teams. And I think we're seeing an approach here where it's like KC, like New England, values versatility to a very high extent. So they get a guy like Nicole Hardman, who might not be the X receiver like Tyree Kill was, but he can contribute in kick returning and punt returning. But like, I'm seeing Nicole Hardman starting to get ranked as high as like sixth off the board, eighth off the board in rookie drafts. And I'm like, I understand like the theory behind it and why you would start ranking him higher than he was. He was probably like a third or fourth rounder prior to the draft. But like, what, where do you see Hardman in, in a rookie draft now? Do you think he like automatically steps into a huge role? Because I mean, it is in KC, they're going to need weapons and targets there. Like what, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. I'm just not too sure if you're getting outproduced by Riley Ridley in college, I'm not sure how good of a player you really are, but yeah, just watching him play and, like, looking at the advanced metrics or whatever, he caught 31 out of his 35 balls out of the slot. And obviously those create, like, different mismatches with slower cornerbacks, so that could definitely help with him running up the seam. And he's definitely fast like Tyree Kill. But one thing that I didn't see on tape too much is breaking tackles. He'll evade tackles, but I don't see him, like, running through arm tackles at all, which is something Tyree Kill could do. He's a little, like, thicker, I guess, with three Cs compared to Hardman. But – He also made his money after the catch, and obviously Hardman was used in kick and punt returns, but I just didn't see too many instances where he broke through a tackle, and obviously in the NFL you have bigger, faster, more physical guys, and I'm just not sure he's going to have those huge plays. Obviously, with Mahomes throwing the ball like a fucking madman, he's going to beat defenses every once in a while, but I think he's more of a boom-bust guy than Tyree Kill, who's honestly like a generational talent. I I just don't think he's a one-for-one fit in this offense with him. Yeah, like I get why people would uh, just slide him into the Tyreek Hill role, but Tyreek Hill, by the time like last year rolled around, he was a complete wide receiver. Like he could run all the routes. He had the speed. He had great hands. Like he could do all these things. He was technically very sound, which is something I don't know if we get that with Nicole Hardman. Um, I'm watching film and he, he ran the very, very vast majority of his routes from the slot and they weren't really like routes. He was just kind of running like a drag across the middle. I don't know. I'm not going to be like a, one of those the, the film guys and say like, oh, his, his you know his route tree is not technical. But he just he just wasn't asked to run a lot of, of different routes. Like he wasn't running you know comeback routes and posts and things like that. Um, and you know I was looking at some of the the advanced metrics too. He had 16 deep targets last year and he dropped three of them. So you know one of every five deep balls he's getting he's dropping and that's going to be a, that's a big part of the game between Patrick Mahomes and Tyreek Hill. Can he trust you know throwing the guy? Um, the ball down the field he is much better out of the slot he had seven of his I think nine touchdowns last year scored from the slot Um, but he's just not the receiver I see that Terry Kill was I don't think he's going to be able to line up on the outside and and have success like Hill did because Hill was a 50 percent 55 percent route runner from the outside like he only ran you know whether it was from the backfield in line from the slot 
40 to 45 percent of his routes. And I think Nicole Hardman is going to need to see a much higher percentage of his throws that way. Um, so I, I think we're going to see someone who might get a lot of targets and might get a lot of volume just by default because they're going to need weapons there. But I don't see him adding those uh, necessarily like those big plays that you would almost expect from Tyreek Hill every other week. It's a, it's a weird situation, but I mean, I, I feel like the Chiefs obviously knew what they were doing. They traded up to go get him, and um, they clearly have a fit for him in this offense. I just don't I, – I just think people who think it's a one-for-one one fit with Tyreek Hill are, are definitely jumping the gun there. Yeah, and the thing about him in rookie drafts is he's going to go so early that if you're, like, not high on him, there's, like, no need to worry about, like, oh, do I have to take him or whatever? Like, yeah. oh, he's going to be a boom-bust guy. Just don't draft him. He's being overdrafted right now. Just pick a guy like Paris Campbell and Andy Isabella who are objectively better players who are being picked behind him now. Yeah, exactly. Um, the next pick was J.J. Arcega-Whiteside. I know you and me are both very, very high on this kid. Love him. Beast. 6'2", 225. He's got the size. Ridiculous contested catch. Ridiculous control over his body. Um, like, this I, this was another landing spot I absolutely hated. This, this, like, a lot of these guys could have ended up in good spots where, you know, they swing from the 110 in rookie drafts all the way down to, like, the 103, depending on where they landed. J.J. Arcega Whiteside was one of the guys that kind of moved back for me. He lands in Philly, and it's just like – they just signed Deshaun Jackson. They have Alshon Jeffrey, right? They have a lot of these these playmakers and these big threats and whatever. And it's almost like you're you're thinking of JJ as an heir to Alshon Jeffrey's position. I think Jeffrey. I'm not sure when his contract is actually done. He I might- just looked. I think he signed a four year deal. I think they can cut him for like not too much cap loss in like 2021. But even then, it's two more years. Yeah, it kind of sounds. Yeah, it's, it sounds dumb. Like why even cut Alshon at that point? But it's like I don't know. Um, what do you make of this move? I feel like they're just being in this offense, I like the offense, right? I think they're going to have a monster bounce back this year, but just how high can you even make the ceiling for a guy whose ceiling could have been very high in a better offense? Yeah, once I saw this happen, I actually tweeted out, like, oh, Philadelphia is ruining all these valleys, and some guy called me a fucking idiot. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. But I just feel like he, he like, has the same exact role as Alshon Jeffrey. He's a red zone weapon. He's a big body guy. He's not the fastest, but he wins at the catch point, and they already have that, and not to mention they have Zach Ertz. And also, they haven't done anything with Aguilar yet, and obviously they have the deep threat in Deshaun Jackson. There's so many guys that need targets on this team that I'm just not sure that early on in his career he's going to be the producer that he would have been if he landed on a team that had more of an open depth chart like San Francisco. Yeah, it's it's hard to predict when you're even going to get value back from him because, I mean, a lot of these rookie wide receivers aren't going to produce for you the first year. And, you know, you're not – probably only, I don't know, like four or five of these guys will get drafted regularly in redraft leagues. But it's, you know, it's about making sure that if you use a first-round pick on him, like you're going to eventually get return on investment, you know, two years, three years, four years, the latest down the road. And it's like, where does J.J. Arcega-Whiteside fit into that offense? So he becomes not so much like a risky pick, just like his ceiling is kind of capped. So he's more of a back half of the first round um, – pick for me that's yeah. for, for a team that doesn't need production immediately you're gonna have to like expect to stash him like not someone you can play right away exactly um Paris Campbell went off the board two picks later to the Colts now I think we all kind of knew the Colts were going to go with the wide receiver at some point in this draft whether it's the first round the second round and I tweeted out you know as soon as Paris Campbell was picked I was like this is a perfect pick for that offense because they have a guy in T.Y. Hilton and this this won't affect his value whatsoever because Paris Campbell is a guy that you know, we'll play a different position in that offense and occupy the slot role. And uh, that just brings a whole nother dynamic to this offense. And Paris Hill, uh, <laughs> Paris Hill, <laughs> Paris Campbell uh, was, was someone who brings ridiculous speed to this offense. Four three one, he ran. Um, he just absolutely blew away the combine. And that really put him on the map for a lot of people coming out of Ohio State. Now, I, I like him in this offense, of course. I'd like anyone in this offense. My concern is like, he had two – okay, so he caught 91 passes last year. Only two of them went for 20-plus yards. Like, that's crazy. You know, that, that is yeah. – so Forget you, with that speed. Yeah, so you see the speed and you immediately assume, oh, okay, big playmaker, like downfield threat. And I'm sure he could do that, right? And they're going to utilize him in the screen game, so hopefully he could take those. But, like, that has to be a little bit concerning. That is, is he just, like, so one-dimensional that you could kind of only put him in the slot and he's not really a big play threat? I think it's in part because he was used so close to the line of scrimmage that 
he, he'll break off like a 15 yarder, but he just doesn't have the opportunity to go to the house because he wasn't used deep down the field. He's used a lot in screens and stuff. And I think that actually plays to his benefit with the Colts because I was actually kind of worried that he'd be drafted to a team that didn't have a speed guy on the outside. And they were going to think, Oh, we can just play Paris out there. He's fast. He can run down the field. And we just never saw that out of him. Not saying he couldn't, but I mean, if you're going to put a guy in a role where he's never played before, it'll take some adjusting, but now he gets to play in a role that he was comfortable with and that he produced heavily in college. I think it helps him, but the fact that they have T.Y. Hilton and Eric uh, Ebron on the red zone, even Funchess and stuff, it kind of caps his upside touchdown-wise, but I think he's a good candidate to see upwards of like 50 receptions as a rookie. Yeah, I think a lot of these guys fell into situations where they're awesome players, but they're probably going to be better real-life players for their teams mm -hmm. than they are fantasy, uh, fantasy guys. But Campbell's definitely one of those guys that could – um, really step into a role and and outproduce my expectations for him in year one. He could he could be someone who sees you know fifty or sixty catches and be like a re realistic PPR option, especially as the year kind of progresses. Um, so Paris Campbell is another guy that I'm I you know, I forget how high I had him in my rankings, but he's absolutely a first round uh, target. I, I've seen him as high as like the one hundred four, the one hundred five in that range, and I don't think I could fault anyone for doing that. Uh, it's probably a little rich for my taste. Where are you targeting him? Yeah, for me before the draft, I actually was a little bit lower on Campbell than most guys just because of the concerns I had of him being like a deep threat. Mm -hmm. As of right now, he's actually like, I have a tier of like three receivers and both of them we'll talk about right up next, but he's like in the wide receiver three to five tier amongst rookies. So I'd take a shot at him in like the middle of the first round. Yeah, I have in one of my leagues, I have the 105 and the 107 picks. And I'm like, I'm going to end up probably grabbing one of these, you know, A.J. Brown, Paris Campbell, or one of the next guys that we'll talk about in a second. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's where I would assume most of them are going to go off the board here. So um, Andy Isabella, I'm, I'm assuming, is the next guy yeah. up in, in that tier for you. Mm -hmm. He, I believe this pick the Cardinals got from the Miami Dolphins in the Josh Rosen trade. So he goes off the board three picks later, 30th, in the second round, Andy Isabella, small kid from UMass, but he plays big. This kid could play outside. This kid could play inside in the slot. He absolutely blew away his, you know, his, uh, his metrics in terms of the speed. I think it was like a, also a four, three, one, a lot of guys running ridiculous 40 times in this class. Uh, but people obviously look at Isabella. They see a small white kid and they assume slot role. Look at this Arizona offense. And like, I don't know how they are going to run this thing. It's just going to be like, that's Alec how they're going to do it. They're going to run. They're going to run from everybody that comes at them. Yeah, I know. They just completely faded the offensive line, and now it's just going to be like Kyler, scramble out to the right side, have fucking Christian Kirk, Larry Fitz, Andy Isabella, Hakeem Butler run fucking go routes and then chuck it up to one of them. I, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't really know how this is going to work. Um, but Andy Isabella as a prospect, you know, he, he went to UMass, so the concern is, oh, okay, small school prospects, small – um, competition, whatever, but he tested as an elite athlete, as high as any of these guys in the, in the class. We saw him dominate against a team like Georgia in college, and he and he's put up numbers against good teams. So um, what are any concerns that you would have about, you know, taking Isabella? Because if, if you kind of didn't see a picture of him, you know, you would probably be like, okay, he's, he's a first rounder, no doubt. Yeah, my only concern really is their offensive line, because if you look elsewhere, they invested in Hakeem Butler, they have Isabella, obviously. Uh, Christian Kirk is a young guy, David Johnson, Kyler Murray, all that. If they can't get that offensive line sorted, I'm not sure how effective Isabella will be. Like he made a lot of his money off those double move deep routes. Mm -hmm. In the NFL, you need time to throw those. And with an offensive line full of guys who just lay down once they snap the ball, I'm not sure that Kyler Murray is going to be able to get it to him. But he's also very quick, so he could work near the line of scrimmage as well. I just think his upside is capped until that team invests heavily in the offensive line. Yeah, just because of the type of player he is. And he makes so much of his money, you know, down the field. And like you said, on the double go routes and things like that and catching the deep ball. And I think it's going to be a good fit with Kyler because he is so precise on his deep balls. But it's like the offense, we have no idea. It's still a very risky offense. I think Vegas has them pe pegged at like five wins for their over-under. So it's not like we should expect them. I mean, maybe they score 25 points a game, but they're definitely going to be letting up like 35 a game. So it could be could work out for a lot of these wide receivers, but kind of looks like a jumbled mess. Um it's like a Madden team where it's like you throw the best athletes on there and, you know, let Kyler throw for 450 yards and hopefully your guys can rack up some points. What you know, I think we're just going to skip to Hakeem Butler just because it's, you know, the Cardinals conversation here. Now, Hakeem Butler was one of the most like tantalizing prospects coming into the draft. And some people like Evan Silva had him as his wide receiver one. 
Um, I think he was my wide receiver three or four prior to the draft. Now, like people ranking Butler ahead of Andy Isabella in their rookie drafts, I, I think um, – I think it's ignorant. I think it's ignorant yeah. because the Cardinals told you how they felt about those two wide receivers by the draft capital they put into them, right? They took Andy Isabella in the second round. They took Hakeem Butler in the fourth round. And all of these teams passed on Hakeem Butler multiple times. I mean, when I watched the film, I was like, holy shit, Hakeem Butler's a beast. But um, there are other concerns there, of course. Like, where do you see Hakeem Butler even fitting into this offense? I feel like he's not even going to be on the field for more than, you know, 50 to 60% of the snaps this year. That's what I feel. He's already 23 years old. I think he's going to play a lot of the same role that we saw out of Larry Fitzgerald, that big slot role, where yeah. it does bring a lot of fantasy value, but he's not going to be on the field early probably. If he gets to learn from Fitz, that's a, like a great guy to learn from. Yeah. But he's just not going to have the experience, and plus he's already older. It's going to take him a while, and obviously his lifespan as a receiver in the NFL isn't as long as a guy like Isabella, and Isabella's going to have more early production. Yeah, and, and going back to – like Cliff Kingsbury's time in, in college, I remember looking at some of the numbers in terms of like the top wide receivers and the production on the teams that he was coaching. And it was guys like Kiki QT was a slot receiver. And uh, I think it was Jakeem Grant. And those were, you know, the biggest producers on those teams. And they were running out of the slot and they were um, putting up big numbers for college. And it's like, we don't really know what to expect with all these wide receivers between Isabella and Fitz and Kirk, because they all have similar skill sets in the fact that they could play outside, but they could also play in the slot. And that's kind of the same with the King Butler, like you said. I mean, he's 6'5". He's massive, but he can play in the slot. And we saw him have a lot of success there. So it's, it's four very, very versatile receivers. And that's not even um, getting into Keyshawn Johnson, who they also took in the sixth round. I love took, that guy. He took, do you? Yeah, he's like – he reminds me of Stephon Diggs for some reason. He's like – I don't know. He just looks awesome out there. Well, listen, they got five good receivers now, so <laughs> – um, it's, it's going to be a crazy jumble of shit going on there. But I think at this point with the King Butler dropping all the way to the fourth round after guys like Terry McLaurin and, and Deontay Johnson and stuff like Butler, you, you can't look at Butler anywhere earlier than like the late second round and rookie drafts, in my opinion. Yeah. He fell for me from the wide receiver three to like my wide receiver nine, just yeah, because of how late he was taken and how crowded that team is right now. Yeah. I, th I think he's like, uh, maybe 25th overall in my rookie rankings. And speaking of that, Big Dog team has been working very hard on our, uh, our rookie dynasty fantasy football draft guide, which is available right now on bigdogsdraftguide.com. That's B-I-G-D-O-G-S, draftguide.com. We're hitting all of the top prospects, just like we're kind of doing right now, but in much greater depth. Uh, the running backs, wide receivers, quarterbacks, tight ends, we have our rankings up there um, for the rookie rankings, as well as full dynasty rankings. And we have a bunch of exclusive content and articles on there. Um, just helping you prep. If you are an experienced dynasty player, there's stuff for you on there. If you're brand new, this is probably even better for you because it's got a lot of stuff, uh, tips on how to start and mistakes not to make once you get into um, your first like rookie or dynasty startup draft. And then me and Noah are going to be putting out some other uh, exclusive videos as, as the time goes on. I think we're going to do a first round mock draft probably next week and put it into the draft guide. So if you are getting into uh, into the season, if you're ready to get some startups going, make sure you head over to bigdogsdraftguide.com and cop, 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 cop. Let's get Definitely it. Let's move on to um, DK Metcalf. DK Metcalf. Uh, there are so many things like to cover with DK Metcalf between like the phone call with Pete Carroll and then him <laughs> going into the uh, meeting shirtless. But like, we don't have, we don't have all day to do this. So let's talk about DK Metcalf landing in Seattle. First of all, he was the Vegas. I was on favorite to um, be the first wide receiver off the board. He drops to, I think he was what? the 10th, maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ninth wide receiver off the board, the 32nd pick in the second round to the Seattle Seahawks. We're hearing the news of Doug Baldwin likely to retire and likely not to be with Seattle anymore. Um, I, I don't know if you could have found a better landing spot for DK. I know the draft capital is not where you wanted it to be. So him falling out of the first round definitely, you know, says a little bit of something to me. And I don't like him as a prospect. I, I just, I still think like just because he's with Russell Wilson doesn't mean he's going to be a complete wide receiver. Um, in this role, I almost, you know, I, we didn't like DK. But now I like him more after landing here. I, I think, like, what's the difference? Why can't DK just be a six foot three Deshaun Jackson? You know, he's not really asked to That's run true. over the middle and too much. You know, like, I think everyone looks at him and is like, he has to be Calvin Johnson or Julio Jones. 
or his career is over. I think there can be middle ground there and he could be a specialized player like Deshaun. I would argue that Deshaun is a much better route runner and, and probably a more complete receiver. But I think there's probably middle ground to be had. And if there was somewhere that he could find that middle ground, it was absolutely with Russell Wilson in an offense that um, is void of, of any real playmakers and targets. Yeah, especially in the red zone. Look who they have. Tyler Lockett. What is he? Five foot ten. Yeah, David yeah. Moore. He's a little bit bigger, but he's not anything special. And they don't really have a tight end of consequence. Obviously, Metcalf doesn't run the like most expansive route tree. But if you watch him play, he will win over the middle of the field on just simple slant runs because he's six three, two thirty, and exactly. he's built like fucking Larry Wheels. Like he's gonna win whenever he's like matched up with a smaller cornerback, and especially over top, like a four three three speed. Like, on the other side, you got Tyler Lockett. They're not going to be able to, like, focus all on him. With a guy with that side and speed, and Russell Wilson's the best deep ball thrower in the NFL. I think he had the third most deep ball attempts last year, and he led the league the year prior, and he's very accurate on them. I think it's just a perfect fit in an offense that really doesn't have any weapons on the outside other than Lockett. Yeah, I don't know if I can name a better place for him to land. Um, and, and just speaking on the offense, obviously they were very run heavy, but I think just the fact that they paid – Wilson all this money plus they are drafting you know these receivers now and giving him hopefully more passing weapons to work with like that has to tell you that they are going to lean a little bit more on the pass um, in 2019 and it's not like I don't think DK is necessarily someone you need to have you know 120 targets to succeed you give him uh, a few of these deep targets that are going to be on point like he'll catch a few of them and make some big plays which is why I'm like definitely lighting up to DK in the fact that he can be a Deshaun Jackson type and he can be a burner like that. He doesn't need to be, you know, the high end of the spectrum or the low end of the spectrum. It's just the, the media has created it to the point where, you know, it, it's, it's one or the other. Um, but with DK, you know, like he's someone that I would start actually to consider around that like 107 spot, you know, um, maybe even earlier, depending on how high you are on him. I'm not, I probably wouldn't reach any earlier than that, but uh, it's definitely better coming out of the draft than it was going in the draft. Yeah, he kind of reminds me of that, like, Martavis Bryant role. Uh, I think it was 2015 with the Steelers where they didn't have Juju yet and all they really had was Antonio Brown. And Tyler Lockett's kind of comparable to Antonio Brown for the fact that he's versatile and he wins, like, on all levels. And he didn't have too many targets, but I think he finished near, like, a top 12 receiver just because of his deep presence and his ability to win in the red zone. And without having too many other guys out there, he's going to have to get a few targets here and there. And last year was the only time Russell Wilson went – under 30 throws per game since I think 2014 so with the lack of weapons he's gonna get looks and especially deep down the field that brings a ton of fantasy value yeah it's the perfect storm for a guy like DK Metcalf to to succeed and so I'm um, definitely a little bit higher on him now now speaking of the Steelers they trade up into the early third round second pick of the third round we knew that they were going to need another weapon on the outside they don't trust James Washington they lose Antonio Brown Deontay Johnson out of Toledo, 5'10", 183 pounds, an 18th percentile weight adjusted speed score, 4'5", 3". So a 4'5", 3", 40 is not, you know, slow. It's definitely not fast for wide receivers, but it's not slow. But when you're 5'10", 183 pounds, you want that Nicole Hardman speed, baby. You want that Paris <laughs> Campbell speed or else what the fuck are you doing on my team? So an 18th percentile weight adjusted speed score he produced in college, but he went to Toledo. He didn't produce at a crazy high level. Um, his breakout age was almost 21 years old. Burst agility are all not there. Like, what, what the fuck was this pick by the Steelers? I don't even know. Didn't they just invest third-round capital in James Washington last year? And they just signed, uh, what's his name, Moncrief? Dante Moncrief, yeah. What's, what's the point of picking him? I, I, think this was, I think this was more of an indictment on James Washington. I think Moncrief is going to or, – or the fact that they just don't trust any of these fuckers out here. It might have been a fuck you to Antonio Brown. That's about it. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I don't, I don't know what they're getting out of this. He's just – he's not a uh, – assuming – okay, so he's going to – he's 22 and a half. He'll probably be 23 almost by the time the season starts. So he's an older prospect. And I'm assuming – I'm assuming this is, this is what the world has come to. The fact that his metrics and his numbers and his, his measurables look so bad, that almost guarantees that the people who only watch film love this guy. Right. That, that has to be, that it. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If we go on Twitter right now and type it in, I bet you people are like, Oh my God, he's such a great route runner and <laughs> so much separation and shit like that. So watch yeah, my film awesome. room. Yeah. The profile looks miserable. So he's not someone that I am uh, going to be reaching for, not because he went to the Steelers. He's not someone that I'm like, Oh, okay. You know what? He fits into that wide receiver two role and it's interesting, but like, 
I don't know. I mean, the, the draft capital does speak a little bit. So he's someone that you obviously have to keep your eye on now. Um, but I'm going to have to look at him a lot more in depth if I'm going to use even like a second round rookie pick on him. Yeah, you said he's 22 and a half, right? Mm hmm. Yeah, James Washington is 23 right now. So it's not even like he's like an older guy. And James Washington's breakout age, I think I just saw was the 97th percentile. So, I mean, what, what was the point of that whole pick? It was like a poor man's version of James Washington. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah, weird pick here, weird pick. Um, the next pick off the board directly after that was Jalen Hurd out of Baylor um, with the 49ers. And, you know, I kind of like this pick. Because Jalen Hurd, I believe he was a running back, and then he was changed into a wide receiver. And he actually – He was so, the running back in Tennessee when Alvin Kamara was there. Interesting. Didn't he run for over 1,000 yards one year? Yeah, he, he put up, like, crazy numbers as a running back at, he like, 6'5". So he posted 1,000 yards as a running back. He's 6'5", 226 pounds. Like, you don't see running backs at, at the height of 6'5". The Niners drafted him as, I mean, technically a wide receiver, but more so as a weapon. Uh, it's, a, it's, again, it's like these good offensive minds, guys like Kyle Shanahan and KC and New England, they value the versatility of these players, not just players and, and what their talent is, but they know how to throw them into their system and, and put them all over the field. And that's what I had imagined Jalen Hurd becoming, you know, almost like a quarter L Patterson or like something like that. But it's also like, you know, how much fantasy value can that really give you? Um, I, I think Hurd will get a lot of playing time in his rookie year just because you could use him all over the field. He's got great, you know, size and, and that kind of thing. But um, where do you see him, like, fitting into his offense? And where do you, you know, where are you looking at him um, rookie-wise? Yeah, just touching upon his production, he actually rushed for 899 yards his freshman year and then 1,285 his sophomore year. Wow. And then he became a receiver and put up 940 yards. So he's obviously a very good football player. Yeah, But in this offense, they just drafted Debo Samuel. They have Dante Pettis. They have George Kittle. They have Jarek McKinnon. I'm not sure where he fits. I heard reports that he's going to put on weight and play tight end. So I guess this guy just wants to play like every position in the league. I'm just not sure like how well he fits into this offense just for the fact that they have so many weapons. Yeah, I mean, he ran a 4-7. So it's like that's not going to get it done on the outside. I mean, he, he is huge, obviously, but – like those kind of numbers, if you converted them over to a tight end would be fantastic. But again, they have Kittle there. So it just seems like they're going to be using him, you know, put him in the backfield and then line him up in line and then maybe outside in, in the red zone or something because he does have big size. So it seems like a cool pick. Like 49ers fans are going to love him because like you said, he's good at football, right? You don't put up those kind of numbers at multiple positions if you can't catch on very quickly and, you know, just be productive all around. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting player that I'm going to keep an eye on. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure – if we're really ever going to see any fantasy value kind of come to fruition with this guy. Yeah, for Jalen Hurd also, only two receptions and 25 yards came from outside of the slot last year. So he, really? he did everything in the slot. He had the 10th most slot receptions and 9th most yards out of the slot of college receivers last year per pro football focus. So I'm not sure. Maybe he'll just be like an inline receiver, like an inline tight end or whatever, like a split end or whatever. I'm just not sure he's going to be used on the outside and be that like – big body that you'd expect out of a guy who's six foot five yeah it almost seems like they might use him in specific um situations like he might be a situational player yeah well the thing with the 49ers they actually run the most two tight end sets in the league i think around 56 percent of the time so maybe they just put him in there instead of like garrett Selleck or whoever the hell they got out there just i don't know that, 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 that could make sense um terry mclaurin out of ohio state paris campbell's teammate um getting thrown the ball from Dwayne Haskins. He goes in the third round to the Washington Redskins. Um, so him and Dwayne Haskins are now paired up in Washington. Can you tell me about Terry McLaurin? Because I, I, to be honest with you, he was not someone that was really on my radar. Um, he was not someone I was like really excited about. Like no matter where he went, I don't think I would have been excited about. Uh, his metrics look very good in terms of like speed and stuff. But is he a one trick pony? Is that all he's really good for? From what I've seen out of him, kind of. He's just fast and he's a deep threat. He caught 35 balls, which was half as much as the second leader on Ohio State, K.J. Hill. He had 70, and McLaurin had 35. He did have 11 touchdowns, but he's just he's just a deep threat, really. And, I mean, I think the best receiver on Washington right now, if he can stay healthy, is Paul Richardson. I was going to so say, I'm, isn't this guy like a kind of a, like a Paul Richardson clone? Yeah, just like a worse Paul Richardson. And, obviously, <laughs> he's, like, never on the field, but – if he's out there, there's really – I'm not sure there's much of a role for him. 
Yeah, I don't. I, I don't really like that pick. I don't. The Redskins are um, stupid. Are, they're a, they're a confusing franchise. I'm not really sure. <laughs> I feel like that. the second receiver they took more than him. So, who else did they get? Uh, Kelvin Harmon. Oh, Kelvin Harmon. Yeah, I mean, uh, Kelvin. Uh, he fell all the way to the uh, to the sixth, sixth round. Yeah. yeah, we'll get to him in a second. But we have one more player that was drafted. One more wide receiver drafted in the third round. That was Miles Boykin, Notre Dame. Um, absolutely blew away his combine, and I know a lot of people liked him because of that. He was someone who um, not only blew away the combine, but people who, like, watched the tape and stuff really liked this guy. 6'4", 220, ran a 4'4", 240-yard dash. Problem is um, he didn't produce at a crazy level in college, and when he did, it was not till much, much later in his career. So he's a, he's a late breakout guy who kind of wowed at the combine, fell to the end of the third round, but again – same problem with Hollywood is that he fell to Baltimore. So it's like, uh, yeah, I was like what? Yeah, the, up, <laughs> the upside there is really limited in Baltimore. Like no, no matter who they pick, they could have gotten Jerry Rice, and I'd be like, yeah, forty-five catches, like <laughs> six hundred yards. Like, yeah. <laughs> really temper my expectations. Uh, in my write-up on Boykin, I was kind of low on him, just because the same thing with Paris Campbell really like he's a big guy and he's fast not uh, Campbell isn't but Boykin and I was just afraid that a team would pick him to be that outside deep threat when in reality from what I saw he's much better like in the middle of the field just boxing players out not really winning deep and I think with the Ravens choosing Marquise Brown he's going to be the one that's burning people down the field while Butler works over the middle of the field so in that sense it's a good fit but in the scope of the offense like I'm not sure how happy you can be about any Ravens pass catcher yeah that's the thing but maybe I don't know dude maybe they set up this offense in a way that it's like very quick hitting and they just use Boykin and and Hollywood on on screens and like really short routes and very like quick hurry up kind of thing so maybe it could surprise us and these guys could be um, guys to watch in, in PPR but right now for Miles Boykin yeah like you said the Ravens uh, offense just absolutely crushes people's upside so that was all the wide receivers within the first three rounds um like you said you like Kelvin Harmon to Redsk uh, to the Redskins more than you like uh McLaurin but Kelvin Harmon went at the end and end of the sixth round he was someone that like people thought he could end up going you know back half of the first round maybe somewhere in the mid second round he falls really far so with Kelvin Harmon falling to the sixth end of the sixth round I don't want to say he's undraftable in rookie drafts, but he's someone you take a, a really late flyer on, maybe back back into the third round, um, probably fourth round or undrafted. Um, what you like Harmon more than you like McLaurin, but yeah. you see any way to like playing time for him? I like Harmon more than McLaurin, but I don't like McLaurin one bit, so it's not really saying much. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like he's compared to McLaurin, he's actually going to have a role in this offense because they don't have a big body guy. I mean, Paul Richardson doesn't play the same role, neither does McLaurin. Jordan Reed is always out. Like It's like whatever. Josh Doxson, too. Yeah, I mean, Josh Doxson's had forever to, like, do anything and yeah. whatever. I just – the same issue with him is what's with Doxson, that he doesn't separate. I just think Harmon's, like, a, such a good player that he'll have his chance. Even if he was a six-round pick, I think he'll have his chance to show what he's about but you're not going to have to pick him high enough for him to like return for him to need to return like top five rookie receiver value. You can get him as like the 12th to 15th receiver off the board. And at that price, it's not too much of a risk. Yeah. So I, I just caution rookie drafters, like especially new ones, though that, those first two rounds should be almost completely filled with guys that were drafted within the first three rounds of the actual NFL draft. So I know like you might have liked Kelvin Harmon a lot going into the draft, but the fact that he was drafted so late in the NFL draft tells you what the NFL thinks about him. Um, so don't use, you know, your second round pick on Kelvin Harmon just because you remember the name and you, and you liked what you saw on film or whatever. Make sure that if you are taking a flyer on a guy like that this late in the draft, that it's going to be, you know, like I said, earliest I would look at him is I probably, you know, I wouldn't touch him until like the fourth round of rookie drafts, but I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to get mad if you wanted to grab him in, in the back half of, um, of the third round, because he was one of the more polarizing prospects going into the draft. Uh, now there was, there was a, a ton of guys picked from rounds four through seven um, and some undrafted free agents that were signed within the last few days after the NFL draft concluded. You have any guys on this list that are, you know, some, some low key breakout potential for our people or more like late round, um, targets in rookie drafts so I guess we're just skipping over Riley Ridley huh 
Was he? Uh, he, he, he was a fourth round pick. He doesn't get that respect. <laughs> yeah. I actually think I was t- uh, telling you earlier, I actually think the other receiver that the Bears invested in is better than Ridley. And they got him through undrafted free agency, which is Emmanuel Hall. Mm. He's a burner. Right now they have Taylor Gabriel, but he could easily just step in and take over that role. Uh, Mitch Trubisky doesn't care where the ball goes when he throws it. So if he's doing, if he's going to take a shot deep, Emmanuel Hall is going to find his way to the end of it. He averaged over 100 yards a game as uh, in his senior year or his last year in college, and he did play with a pretty good quarterback in Drew Locke. But I just think he has really good upside for a guy who you're probably not even going to have to pick, or he's going to be like a last round pick. So uh, there's not too much like cost to taking him, and he definitely has one of the higher ceilings. And another sneaky guy I like is Scott Miller. Uh, the Bucks chose him, and I think the sixth or seventh round. He's like a 5'8 white guy. And I think he ran a 4-4. He played for like Bowling Green. Yeah. But with Deshaun Jackson out and uh, the other guy, Adam Humphreys out, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of targets to go around. And with Bruce Arians loving to throw the ball, obviously the big three there with uh, Mike Evans, Godwin, and O.J. Howard, they're going to get fed. But, I mean, Scott Miller could be something. I don't even think he's being drafted at all. No, so why not no just way. take a I, shot? I, I, if you gave me 300 guesses as to where – like what position this guy played or what school he was at, I would get them all <laughs> wrong. But yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense in the Adam Humphreys role. I want to circle back to Emmanuel Hall. I, I, yeah, I can't believe that this guy didn't get drafted. I mean, when you look at just who he is as a player, I mean, he's got size, 6'2", 200 pounds. Um, that's NFL size, right? And he ran a 4'3", 40, which puts him like in the 90th percentile for weight adjusted speed. His burst score was in the 99th percentile. College dominator, breakout age, both, you know, 55%, 50th, 55th percentile or above. 22.4 yards per reception in college. Uh, I got some other stats from PFF prior to us uh, jumping on. I was looking at um, him because I, I was just I was just very very shocked that you know someone was able to grab him in the free agency, and I like him kind of jumping in for Taylor Gabriel. I could totally see him playing a much more productive part of that offense than Gabriel did. Um, Emmanuel Hall, Gabriel, but taller. So yeah, exactly. And Emmanuel Hall was second in the NCAA last year in yards per route run, uh, 4.14. 12 catches of 20 plus yards. So he's an explosive downfield playmaker as well. And, and that speed is really like elite NFL speed. So the fact that he has size, speed, produced in college and did it at a young age tells you all you should, you know, all you need to know when it, when it comes to like these prospects. And I, I don't know how the NFL missed on this one, but I, uh, I'm pretty sure we have not heard the last of Emmanuel Hall. Yeah, I love the guy. He's like, he's so quick too. Like, it's not like he's just going to win deep. He can catch like short, well, he has to catch the ball, which is something he struggles with. But, like, he can catch, like, a short pass, like a screen, and he makes people miss after the catch. It's not like he's just going to be used as, like, a deep threat who might catch one ball every four weeks that means something. He could be – I don't know. He could be, like, a contributor, not early just because they didn't pick him. It's, like, bad draft capital. But yeah, he definitely has the upside to be a good NFL receiver. Yeah, I bet we'll hear some buzz about him uh, throughout the summer. He played with Drew Locke, right? Mm-hmm. He made yeah. Drew Locke. That's, that's, that's the word around town is that he made Drew Locke, not the other way around. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'll definitely be keeping an eye on Emmanuel Hall, uh, as well as all the other guys that we kind of talked about. And I think that kind of wraps up all of the bigger names. If y'all have any other names that you want to discuss, drop a comment down below and we'll, uh, we'll yell at you and, and fight back and forth and whatnot. <laughs> and while you're down there, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Make sure you're following both myself and Noah on the Twitter and go cop that draft guide right after this video. BigDogDraftGuide.com. We out. We love you. Goodbye. Peace.